Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Fall cypress and spirea are great landscape options. Today we're going to talk about them. Also, if you're thinking about hiring a landscape professional, we have a few tips to help you out. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis. And Celeste Scott is here. Celeste is a UT Extension agent in Madison County. Yes, Thanks sir. for joining us. Thanks for having us. All right, yep. Joellen, we're going to talk about some great landscape options. The first one we'll talk about, false cypress. Can you tell us false a little bit cypress. about that? Yeah, okay. it's the chemiciparous. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of them. It's a coniferous evergreen, which okay. means it stays green all year long, uh -huh. which is nice in the landscape. Uh, there is a very large, diverse group. There are 60 feet plus trees in it. It's tall. And there are dwarf miniature uh, plants that only uh, measure in inches. So, and that it, is dwarf. <laughs> that that oh is, it's, it's a very diverse group and, and large. Now, some of them are fast growing and some of them are slow growing. Okay. The ones that are fast growing tend to be the larger ones. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, some of the rock garden and small ones, they don't grow very fast at all, which is why they only stay yeah, inches small. tall. Okay. So that makes sense. Okay. And the larger ones are used like hedges, you know, in the landscape. You know, you can get several of them and make a little hedge, okay. get different kinds, okay. and mix it up with other plants because you don't want a monoculture and a hedge. Then some of the smaller ones, because they're so unique in their shapes and sizes and colors, mm. that they're mostly used as specimens. You can put them in a container or just in the landscape, but you don't mass plant them. Okay. It, it's not one of those kind of uh, plants. It's more of a specimen specialty plant. Okay. And of course, the chemiciparuses that are most used in the south are the uh, obtuse and Pacifera varieties that, that, and cultivars of those, and there are many of them, many, many, many. Um, a lot of the leaves are curled and twisted, hmm. and some of them are just like little cords. Oh, and they all very, very interesting and, and hmm. unique okay. in, their, in their own shapes and sizes. They like well-drained soil. Okay, okay. So we don't tend to have that so mm. much in the south, uh, in this area. So, you know, try to create a condition where there is a well-drained area. Okay. Now, I have successfully planted these in the ground, but I was careful of where I placed them, and I've had them for years. Okay. Uh, but you do have to worry about that, and they do like sun, so uh, don't give them too much shade. Full sun? Not full Not sun. Not full sun. Just... But, well, the larger varieties like full okay. sun, but the smaller varieties could use some shade here okay. in this area. Okay. But they can take quite a bit of sun. Container is a good place to put them. In fact, the smaller varieties really do well in rock gardens. Hmm. And um, the new Hypertufa containers that they're making, they always want a dwarf, you know, Camisipris to put in there because hmm. okay. they're so unique and they're so small. Okay. Uh, they're relatively free of insect pests, too. Nothing really That's a good thing. gets on them. Yeah. Uh, now, I have seen bagworms oh. get on them, but of course, you know, <laughs> right. bagworms get on they anything. They get on everything. Get right. on. <laughs> that sounds pretty good, though. It's easy care. Uh -huh. I like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Put it in the pot. Doesn't need much water. Mm -hmm. Can take some sun. Mm -hmm. I think cute, I could do that. Cute little specimen plants. It sounds exciting. Right. Now, there's one more I want to mention. Go ahead and mention And that is... The, the false cypress that is native to the United States. Oh, sure. There's Miami. one that's native. It starts in Maine, goes down to the, it's a, it's a coastal plant mostly. Okay. In Maine, down to Florida, and then in Alabama and Mississippi. Hmm. And you'll find it in wet areas, which is why it is so unusual, because the others don't particularly care for that much uh -huh. water. I got you. But since these are larger cypresses and they like the sunshine, 
they have figured out they don't want to be in competition with everything else that's around the you know around them. So they have found that if they live in a wet area, they can get into full sun. Okay. And what's the name of that variety? It's uh, Thoides. Okay. T h y o i d e s. Thoides. Chemicipris thoides. And it is native to the United States. And what they're trying to do, there are quite a few cultivars of it that are going, you know, so that it might be available, but it might be available in a catalog. It may not be a, in a garden center around you. You should have one or two somewhere. They're just so unusual okay. and interesting. All right. So Joellen says get one or two of those. You've convinced right. me. I'm getting one. That sounds good. <laughs> All right. Now let's talk about spirea. Yes. So what do we need to know about planting spirea? Uh, spirea likes well-drained soil. Okay, well-drained soils, right? And, and, but it's really not particular about where it's planted. Okay. So, but it doesn't want to be in boggy, wet feet. Okay. Um, the ones that you think of the most are the first ones that bloom in the spring. They're usually white. Mm -hmm. There's different varieties of those, and they're so, usually big. A lot of people, do they call them like bridal veil? Yeah, bri yeah, bridal wreath spirea Re bridal is Re one of them. Okay. And those are the older varieties. Yes, that's what I always hear, hear about. The and medicine. they are nice, but a lot of people don't have five, seven feet. They're big. Tall and wide to a place to, to plant mm -hmm. them. So there is, if you want a spring blooming one, there is another one that has been developed. It's called Snow Mound. Mm. <laughs> and it has, it blooms when their leaves just start coming out on it, but it has these big, huge corms or you know, groups of flowers mm -hmm. that are really pretty, so they're not okay. single on the stems like the others. Oh, okay, okay. like clusters, they're yeah. clusters. as you go right. down along it. Right. And they're very, oh, very sounds, pretty. That sounds beautiful, and okay. it's smaller, more compact. It's a little bit smaller, oh, maybe yeah. four or five feet. So it's still a large shrub, so fairly large yeah. shrub, but you can keep it pruned. Uh, but all of those that I've just talked about bloom in the spring. So, you know, nice. as a rule of thumb, when we prune them is after they finish mm -hmm. blooming. So right. that's how you can control their that's height. Right. Now, didn't we plant some spirea in our family pot bed out front? Yes, and ah. that is what the, the exciting part of spireas are for okay. me, are the dwarf spireas. Okay. They get about three feet or lower mm -hmm. in height. Mm -hmm. and. The one we planted out front was Anthony Waterer. That's right, huh? It's got that lavender pink bloom on it. I like that. They start blooming in May and June, and then they'll bloom, you know, almost the summer until it gets really, really hot. And then it'll be sporadically. It just okay. won't be as a full bloom. And so, you so know. it's kind of like separate from the other first ones that we yes, talked about. And yes. then go a, a different, you know, these summer are, type. These are, yeah. There, some of them are related to the others, but they're, these are the cultivars that they've developed, oh. which has really been exciting. Um, okay. There's one that I like called Gold Flame. <laughs> cool name. It has a russet red foliage and yellow in the springtime, and then it has pink flowers on it, but the, the foliage fades as it gets hotter, so mm. it'll get a little bit more green, and sometimes it ends up being green. Mine is green right now okay. because it's, it's gone through the summer, but in the fall, it picks up the fall colors of russet and orange and and like yellow yeah, again, I like those colors. Oh, okay. which is nice, and it nice holds its colors. leaves a little bit longer than a lot of other deciduous shrubs. So, right. it does have. I like it for okay. the foliage. The, the to me, the flowers are kind of insignificant, okay. but the foliage is spectacular, and there's a lot of people who like it, and it's easy to find. Okay. Uh, the smallest one that's easy to find in the uh, nurseries and garden centers is called Little Princess. Little Princess. And it's really cute. It doesn't get more than around a foot, foot and a half tall. It's small. Okay. Yeah, it's small. It has pink flowers. It's got green foliage, nice green foliage. And, you know, for the modern landscape that doesn't have always have space, I mean, these smaller spireas will give you blooms in June and July when, you know, there's yeah, not a lot else. of things right. are That's blooming. Right. That's right. All right. Well, Joel, we definitely appreciate that good information. Good landscape options there. Thank you much. Soldier bugs, yeah, those are pretty neat. You know, they are actually a type of stink bug. Oh, okay. So finally a stink bug that's not all bad. These will eat um, a lot of different things that um, 
that we want to get rid of as gardeners. Okay. Uh, European corn borer, corn earworm, gypsy moth, caterpillars, oh, yeah. cabbage loopers, flea beetles. I hate those things. <laughs> Colorado <laughs> potato beetles, fall army worms, Mexican bean beetles, and others. Wow, that's a pretty so, extensive list. Um, there's even been some studies where they've tried to lure using uh, pheromones, lure mm. these things into field crops, um, because once again, these it's not real beneficial to catch and, you know, to release these into your crop, but if you can lure them there, that's great. Uh, these things live five to eight weeks and a female can lay a thousand eggs in wow. their lifetime. Okay. You can purchase them online if you have a small greenhouse um, and they use the proboscis. They pierce their prey and suck out the juices. And even their nymphs are predaceous in wow. four out of five of the stages. All right, so let's, let's talk about dealing with the landscape pros, yes, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so what do we need to start with that? Well, really what I like to throw out there first is just the questions that I get in the office, you know, so frequently are the folks have hired some professionals mm -hmm. to come in, do some landscaping uh, around their uh, home, whether it was redoing something that was old that they didn't particularly like, or it's a new um, new home that's being built, and they're, they're just not satisfied with it. They've spent the money mm -hmm. um, and the time and the effort to get it done, and it's not what, they didn't end up with what they thought they were gonna get, okay. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I just think that it's important to educate people about the different types of professionals that you could hire to do these jobs, plan these jobs, talk about what the differences are in them, and then just give some tips on how to, you know, be more successful okay. with your end product. Right, well, let's talk so. about those types of professionals okay. then. Let's do that. So, the first professional that I always want to bring up is um, a landscape architect. Okay. So, those folks are going to have advanced degrees, you know, in that area. Um, they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be plant people, okay? And, mm. and we'll get into who might be more plant people oriented okay. <laughs> in a little bit. But that what they're looking at is the overall master plan. So they're able to incorporate, um, you know, if you need to make changes to the exterior of your home to make it go along with this master plan, mm. if you're wanting to incorporate um, some parking, if you need to keep slope in mind, you need to think about um, irrigation, installing irrigation, um, they're, they're kind of seeing the whole picture okay. instead of just looking at uh, what you're going to plant in okay. your bed. So does that make that sense? Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense? They have, engineer, they have engineering. Right, engineering experience. Yeah, so they know how to move yeah, a lot architects. of dirt. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they're here to, to make this big plan. Um, then, oftentimes, the architects may employ a landscape designer okay. to help them make those uh, particular plant choices and do the, the plant designs. Now, if your project isn't quite that extensive, I would say you may be able to forego the landscape yes. architect <laughs> because they will be definitely more pricey. Yes. Um, mm. They may charge by the hour or they may charge for you know an entire project. Um, or, in, or installments of projects. If it's a big, a big situation, they may want to do it, you know, in compartments. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the difference in the architects and the designer. A designer possibly is going to be more plant oriented. They're right. going to know a lot more about plant material, what's going to do well in certain sites. They tend to have more of a artistic kind of flair, you know. Um, hopefully they're going to be able to communicate well with you mm. and find out what your style is. It would be really similar to if you had someone come into your home and you wanted them to help you decorate your sure. living room. They look at things you already have, um, kind of what your style already looks like, and then try to implement that. Um, and oh, that sounds like Joellen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Help you pick the plants that you need. Yeah. Right plants, right place, right? right. Um, so, uh, again, it's going to be really important to communicate well with them. So the third professional is a landscape um, contractor, okay. which may, those are the folks who are actually going to do an installments of your project. Sure. So maybe they're the ones who are preparing the beds. They're the ones who are installing the plants. The ones who are, you know, if you're getting a new patio laid or having lighting installed, they're the, the people who are going to be subcontracted mm. out to actually do the work. 
Um, often cases, again, if it's a smaller project, your landscape designer may be willing to do those himself. Mm. And so he's not, you know, going to employ that extra contractor. Um, but those are the three basic, cool. okay. um, you know, professionals. And I just, you know, I feel like it's really important that everybody, you know, understands oh, the no, differences good. Good, between good each other. Good descriptions. Role. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. real good stuff. Yeah. Now, what about the tips for success? Okay, good. So I've got quite a few tips, okay. um, but we'll, we'll skim, skim over a few. Um, I think it's super important that you build a, a relationship with your uh, designer, contractor, whoever you know it is that you've chosen to work with. So when I say build a relationship, I just you need to be open and able to communicate, you know, clearly with them. So I would recommend having a sit down meeting. Mm. You need to have a budget in place before you start making plans because sometimes you know you tell them all this stuff you won't and. Then they tell you how much it's going to cost, and you're like, oh, never mind. So you've already started off on the wrong foot. Right. <laughs> so let's tell them up front how much we're willing to spend right. on this project. Um, that's super important. Let's uh, be really open about what we want from those areas. Do we need an uh, area for pets? Do we need areas for the kids mm -hmm. to play? Um, are we more interested in having just a basic foundation planning? Possibly, I hear this a lot, um, folks are plant collectors. People who yeah. love to garden, they want to buy plants themselves sure. throughout the years and add them to their landscape. So if what you need are bones, the bones and the you know good structure, um, let's be clear with them on that so mm -hmm. that they don't overplant and get it too full and then they haven't left you any room for you to put your own spin you know, on this situation. So I think those are some good tips as far as being able to build a relationship. I also like to have a contract with ah, them. Make okay. sure we sign a contract just concerning budget, time frame, uh, the guarantees of their work. If they're gonna have, you know, say that these plants aren't gonna die because I planted mm -hmm. them right, sure. or, you know, we're willing to come in and mm -hmm. help fix things if something, you know, uh, was installed incorrectly, so on and so forth, different things like that. So I think it's good to be covered with that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some other things to keep in mind are, you know, site analysis. So before you start this project, we need to be able to locate all our lines, mm. you know, call 811, know right. where all your buried lines are. Right. Um, if you are aware of, um, like, wet areas, that can be a huge problem, mm -hmm. especially with new homes uh, who have a lot of soil that's been brought in that maybe isn't topsoil and it's not going to drain properly because okay. it's really heavy soils. Um, so landscape designers, most of them are going to have some good solutions on how to help you correct those drainage issues before we start planting. Um, being able to identify if you have a hard pan, you know, a foot and a half underneath <laughs> the soil yeah. and you've <laughs> installed all these plants right. and now it's holding water and mm -hmm and they all die and, and you're not sure why. <laughs> so yeah, just point. being able to uh, kind of analyze some of those site issues before you start would be another tip of mine. And then I think one of the most important tips that I could say is to identify your own personal garden style. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a lot of times I think it's more important to communicate with them what you don't like. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like it's a easier sometimes to say, I don't like this, than this is exactly what I mm -hmm, want. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are never going to know exactly what they want or exactly how they want it to look, mm -hmm. but they know what they don't want it to look like for sure. So I think that that is super important. If you don't know what your garden style is, I say just, you know, go to some botanical gardens, right. go to some local um, private homes, tour right. their gardens. Do the Master Gardener garden do tours. The do the Master yeah, Gardener sure. through our garden gates right. tours right. and get some ideas, you or know. Or at least go to a nursery. Right. Yeah. Local nursery Simple. and look at the plants and say, oh, I like this and I like this. Write the name down mm -hmm. so that, you know, you mm -hmm. have that to communicate. Definitely, definitely. So I think those are That's some good. of the major, major tips that I would have for being successful. That's good stuff. Yeah, thanks. That's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, it never hurts to try to prepare as much as you can on the forefront so that you um, are pleased with what you end up with. All right, well, they will definitely be pleased. All right, thank you much, that's good stuff. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Stop volcano mulching. This is entirely too much mulch around this tree. 
What usually happens is when you have mulch like this piled up against the tree, it keeps the bark wet. When that bark stays wet, it starts to decay. Once it starts to decay, then guess what? You have fungal problems, bacterial problems, and possible pest problems. So what you should do is start taking the mulch away from the tree. You want to expose these root flares. And what you're trying to do with mulch is trying to mimic mother nature. You want to bring the mulch out to the drip line of the tree if you can. Once you take the mulch back, you should always be able to see the root flares. Here are your root flares here. Okay. Leave those exposed. And there you have it. Your tree is going to thank you for it. All right, here's our Q&A session. You ladies ready for these? I'm ready. Sure. These are good questions. Yes, they are. All right, let's start with the first viewer email. What are the best pre-emergents to use for lawns here in the Mid-South? When should I apply them? And this is from Lou, South Haven, Mississippi. Hmm. So, Celeste, yeah. what are the best pre-emerge herbicides Aww. out there? Oh, well, I hate to be biased. Okay. <laughs> We've got a lot of options out there, so I'll just get real with you. We've got, you know, Pendulum, Dimension, uh -huh. Barricade, these are all common pre-emerge yeah, herbicides common. that mm -hmm. are available to homeowners. Any residential folks can buy them and use them. I think most people in the Mid-South are using pre-emerge to help control crabgrass in uh, annual warm season grass in their established Bermuda or warm season lawns, whether that's zoysia or what have mm -hmm. you. Um, and these products will work for that. And if your main objective is crabgrass pre-emerge, application time needs to be around like late February, mm -hmm. early March. Um, exactly. And on the label, they'll actually have recommendations for a split application so that you can make that control last longer. So you'll make your second application six to eight weeks after the first one. And so instead of just getting that 30 to 45 day control, you're extending it to sure. more like maybe 30, maybe even up to 90 day control. Um, some of these these products can also have some pre-emergent effectiveness for select broadleaf weeds. Right. So if your issue is more having problems with um, annual cool season weeds, henbit, dead nettle, things like that. Which is actually lawns. germinating now. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Now. <laughs> um, some late summer, mm -hmm. July applications might be reasonable. And some folks that even enjoy a fall application mm -hmm. of a pre-emerge uh, for some of those that maybe germinate a little later. Um, or maybe the seed that aren't going to come up until January, right. February even. Right. So you have the potential for four applications of pre-emerge, but really I, I wouldn't do all of those. I just would identify what my main issue was. Sure. Is it broadleaf weeds? cool season or is it those um, annual warm season grasses like crabgrass and then decide accordingly. And all of those that you mentioned are readily available to the homeowners. Mm -hmm. Please read and follow the label. Yes, please. All right, so there you have it, Ms. Lou. Thank you much for the question. Uh, here's our next via email. With a picture, I have a Granny Smith apple tree in my backyard that is five years old. It has not grown much since I planted it. It has a white furry spot on one of the branches. Do you know what this is? Also, the past couple of years, it has what looks like sores in the bark. The affected bark on the branches are dark and enlarged. Early in the year, after it puts on new leaves, some of the branches will completely die. I would love to save the tree, but am not sure if it is worth saving. What do I need to do? Thank you. And this is from Miss Deborah right here in Cordova. So let's go back to the first question. All right. White furry spots on one of the branches. Mm -hmm. Do we know what that is? I think so. Yeah. Do we know what it is? What do you think it, it is? It's an insect. Uh huh. And, it's an insect. <laughs> well, well, and it's it's um, um, it's it's like the spittle bug, but it's mm -hmm. not. It, it's the woolly. Apple. It's the woolly, woolly apple, apple aphid. aphid. Woolly <laughs> apple aphid. Yeah. Okay, okay. That's I it. was I was just trying to make sure yeah. that I was on it's, the right. Yeah. <laughs> that's the woolly <laughs> apple aphid. Yeah. And it, it it reminds me of the spittle bug because they both yeah. hide underneath. Their little white foam right. yeah, or cotton white mass cotton mass is what it looks yeah. like, right? And it likes to sit there underneath there and feed on your plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it has pierce sucking mouth parts. Yeah, of course, and it produces those long, uh, white, waxy strands, actually for protection. 
is why it does that. Yeah. So it's protection from chemicals, yes. from chemicals and yeah. predators. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say they don't want yeah. the bugs. So and then the smart. birds come down and eat right. on them. So, yeah. and I think I mean I know that she's only seen that one spot of those. So mm -hmm. I don't think that's probably not causing all these other issues no, that she no. was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but they can be detrimental to young trees. Sure. And there are some root stocks that are actually resistant to the woolly apple aphids. So mm -hmm. if that it's were becoming true. the major problem, I would say a selection of a variety that has the appropriate root stock would be the best option exactly there. Right. But mm -hmm. I think there's other things going on exactly here Exactly right. Well. Because again, those aphids will feed on limbs and mm -hmm. on the roots. Mm -hmm. All right. But yeah, that's another issue. So because she has an affected area bark on the branches that are dark and enlarged. Mm -hmm. Those are cankers. Yeah. Okay. And those cankers are pretty much formed by black rot fungus. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is get in there and prune those out. Mm -hmm. At least, what would you say, six to eight inches into healthy I wood? I definitely would. Yeah. I sure would. Yeah. Those it, need to be pruned out, Miss Deborah. Uh, make sure you don't have any rotten fruit on the tree. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to get that off the tree and get them off the ground as well. Practice good sanitation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that'll get you. Yeah, so I, do you think she should try to save this tree, or it's been five no, years? It hasn't been grown five much. years. I'm well, thinking I might. It depends on how big it is, and if it's a, if it has produced any fruit for her. Sure. Yeah. And if it is, and she wants to save it, that's fine. But I would also suggest, like Celeste said, is there's some other varieties. Right. I have one and called have, right. yeah Enterprise, mm -hmm. and it it hasn't had any. It's been three years old now, and it. Never gotten anything. And it produces, has it? And it hasn't produced, hasn't produced yet. yet. It's, right. I Three mean, I, we're talking, okay. I got it. I I actually um, grafted, grafted it, it onto oh. a stock, and so I've started from zero. Okay. But it's three years old now, and it's taller than me, so that's good. All right. So, yeah, that's another option for you, Miss Deborah. So, I uh, hope this helps you out. So, Celeste, Jordan, thank you. It's been fun. Thank, thank you. Right. Very good. Right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Go to familyplotgarden.com to get all sorts of gardening information. We have over 500 videos and lots of information. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.